Good evening. Tonight we're going to be talking about methylene blue, the magic bullet. The reason my tongue is blue right now. So, this is what all the biohackers on Instagram have been doing over the past year or two is sticking out their tongues and, you know, it's called smurfing, uh, I guess. Uh, so, we'll talk about what methylene blue is, you know, how it actually works in the mitochondria, and why you might consider trying it. But it's definitely a biohack, definitely something for, you know, the advanced uh, health optimizers out there. So, welcome everyone. So while we're waiting for people to log on, we'll kind of go through the, the backstory of, you know, you know, how was methylene blue discovered? Well, it was actually synthesized back in 1876 by a German scientist. It was used for the textile industry. You know, some of the original blue genes were used, uh, were dyed with methylene blue. Uh, it was later discovered in the late 1880s to early 1890s that it could stain uh, cells. And uh, Dr. Ehrlich had used it, and he's the one that gave it the nickname uh, Magic Bullet. He had actually injected methylene blue into, I believe, as a rat, and had uh, noticed that it stained in the brain significantly, and actually would stain organelles that, mostly the mitochondria, uh, that you know were in those energy dense uh, tissues. So the brain, the heart. So he called it magic bullet because he gave it to through the system in the veins, and it went exactly where you know the mitochondria were. Um, so those who've followed me before, seen my little friend, the little mitochondria guy. Uh, you know, the, I hate the word powerhouse of the cell, but we'll use that analogy tonight, mostly from the standpoint that the mitochondria is the source where cellular energy is produced. Oxidative phosphorylation produces ATP. And that's one of the ways that methylene blue helps the mitochondria. So again, the mitochondria, you have many mitochondria per heart cell. You've got approximately 3,000 to 5,000 mitochondria per heart cell. And one of their jobs is to make energy. So they take the energy, I should say the electrons from your foods, so from carbohydrates and fats, and put the electrons into the mitochondria and put it through the electron transport chain, the ETC. There's five steps in it. And it's kind of like a game of hot potato. So there's five um, cytochromes, and they pass the electron down the chain, like hot potato, and at the end, there's something called the ATPase. It's like a top or turnstile. The faster it spins, protons or positive charges going through, and those are getting stuck together, and ATP is made from ADP. The mitochondria will make four main products. It will make ATP, which is an energy currency. It helps fold proteins together so that water can interact with it. It will make metabolic water. It will be deuterium depleted water. You will make carbon dioxide, which is not a complete waste product. Yes, you're going to breathe it out, and then the plants are going to take that carbon dioxide, use sunlight and water, make carbohydrates, and grow a tree, and then start the cycle over again with photosynthesis. But the mitochondria will also make heat, or infrared heat, infrared wavelengths of light that shrinks the water in the mitochondria. And then that pulls those respiratory proteins closer together so electrons can tunnel faster through the system. So methylene blue works in the mitochondria mainly. It helps cycle I should say, it's like an electron donor in the mitochondria. So the electrons um, pass from step one to four, and when it gets to step four, The electron goes through the cytochrome, so it gets to the fourth cytochrome, and oxygen will accept that electron and make metabolic water. So I learned the analogy oil rig. Oxygen or oxidation is losing an electron, reduction is gaining an electron. So the electrons are you know, donate it down the system from cytochrome one to cytochrome four and get oxygen. If you're without oxygen, you know, because you're, you know, above in an airplane and the oxygen concentration's less, if, you know, you're, you know, underwater and not breathing oxygen with a scuba tank, uh, if you've had a stroke, you've had a heart attack and the tissues downstream are hypoxic, you're not gonna be able to create energy effectively without oxygen. So methylene blue can step in and donate the electrons to where oxygen should be. It helps stimulate cytochrome C oxidase, which is the enzyme on the fourth cytochrome that helps produce energy. Um, you know, there's a very 
I'll just sidetrack it. Very interesting uh, article from Dr. Uh, Francisco Gonzalez Lima. Uh, the article is Protection Against Neurodegeneration with Low Dose Methylene Blue and Near Infrared Light. So, you obviously know I talk about red light often. You know, I have the website redlightdoc.com. The four cytochromes were the infrared light actually knocks off nitric oxide and increases electron flow. So you can synergistically use methylene blue with red light therapy. But you know, methylene blue, for those who are joining in, um, was the you know invented or discovered, I should say, in 1876 by the German scientist. Initially as a textile dye, later discovered to stain the mitochondria by Dr. Erlach, and he nicknamed it the magic bullet because when he gave it through the vein, it stained brain tissues in the rats. But ultimately it was found to be antivirucidal, antibacterial, antifungal. And then up until World War II, they were using it for malaria prevention in the troops in the uh, Pacific campaigns. And you know, if you've ever tried methylene blue, yes, you know, if you do oral methylene blue, it's gonna make your tongue blue uh, while your body's using it. But it goes out of your bosses, out of your body on process. So it filters into the bladder and you're gonna pee blue, you know, depending on the color of your urine uh, before that. So if you're taking a ton of B vitamins, you'll get like a neon green Mountain Dew coming out. But, um, but the soldiers used to complain about the, uh, the blue urine, so the, the story is that they then uh, developed other uh, anti-malarial agents and uh, methylene blue fell out of favor, but side note, it's maybe coming back for people who are uh, multi-drug resistant for malaria. But it was often used as a urinary tract infection mitigation up until the invention of antibiotics, and antibiotics kind of took over as well. So it's not an orphan, it was actually you know a quote drug before the FDA was even uh, um, around, so it was actually the first drug I believe. But because there's no real uh, market for it, because no company can uh, patent it at this point. Um, right now, it only has one FDA-approved indication, and that is for something known as met hemoglobinemia. So in my prior uh, practice, when I was still an invasive cardiologist, I was doing procedures known as transesophageal echocardiograms, where we put a thin, flexible probe down the esophagus to take some pictures of the heart, basically from the backside, get very clear pictures. But part of that process is we gave people medications to make them comfortable during constant sedation, but we'd use a topical uh, numbing spray that had lidocaine in it. And that's one of the uh, warnings with that uh, topical lidocaine is that you can cause met hemoglobinemia. Uh, you basically will cause red blood cells that can't hold on to oxygen molecules, and the person will become hypoxic. Um, and the only real antidote for it is methylene blue. And it's methylene blue via IV, Typically, the dose is a milligram per kilogram IV over a few minutes. Um, so most dosages, if you read the literature, are going to be between 0.5 milligrams per kilogram up to 4 milligrams per kilogram. Um, that's a kind of hefty dose for many people. You know, if you look at what the, the biohackers are all doing, they're generally doing the, uh, the trochees from a company called uh, Troscriptions. Um, I have no affiliation with them, but I've tried their products before. They have two different versions of the, the methylene blue product. One is called Just Blue, where it's 16 milligrams of methylene blue. They have another one called, um, I think it's called carnitine. Some of the, I'll, I'll remember in a second what it's actually called. Um, but it has methylene blue, nicotine, um, caffeine, and um, basically CBD in it, more for um, concentration. But methylene blue can work well for concentration as well. That's one of its major kind of nootropic effects is concentration, memory. You know, people report, you know, when they study, then kind of like reorganizes the memory so they you know, uh, can remember it easier the next day. You know, they have some uh, interesting products or um, side effects where it can do fear extinction, so it's useful in some psychiatric instances. You know, they've used it in bipolar patients before. Um, that is the one caveat, you know, you really want to be careful with this stuff if you're on any type of um, psychiatric medications, especially MAO inhibitors, which are old classes of medicines, not many people can anymore, but even if you're on SSRIs, you don't want to be mucking around with this stuff without uh, somebody's supervision and kind of walking you through this. But if you're not on those medicines, there's something that, you know, it's buyer beware. You know, methylene blue is not a regulated industry. Um, you know, you're not going to get your hands on the IV methylene blue that uh, we used to use in the, the Echo Labs. And by the way, I did look that stuff up. It's fairly expensive. It's about $350 a, a vial for that stuff for 50 milligrams. Um, so. The oral uh, methylene blue, you know, you definitely, if you're going to try it, 
you got to find a good vendor uh, and you want a certificate of analysis that looks at for the impurities, the heavy metals, and other contaminants that are in it. There's different grades of methylene blue, and you want to have one that's USP, pharmaceutical grade. There's industrial type methylene blue that has a lot more contaminants in it. That's the stuff that you know they sell for, you know, in uh, the uh, um, pet stores to clean fish aquariums. So it's very useful at helping you know, kill the fungus inside a fish aquarium that has a lot of contaminants and head to nozzle, and you definitely don't want to be uh, uh, ingesting that stuff as a human, you're not a fish. So, um, so somebody is talking about you know, they have Lyme disease, and I think maybe a potential reason for that. It's possible. You know, methylene blue you know, has antiviral, you know, was uh, potentially beneficial against COVID-19 infections. Uh, it's antibacterial, it's antifungal. You know, it supports the mitochondria. It's an, you know, those are disjoining. It's basically an electron cycler. You know, at low doses, it's donating electrons to the different respiratory proteins so that the electrons can flow through. Cytochrome C oxidase gets upregulated, and you make more ATP energy. Um, it also helps as an antioxidant. So, you know, your body makes superoxide. You know, it's a free radical. So, as you're consuming food, it's kind of like putting fuel through an engine. You're going to get smoke. Well. Methylene blue basically soaks up that smoke. It um, reacts with superoxide and turns it into water. So it quenches that oxidative stress in the system. Um, so you know, oxidative stress is not always bad. You know, it's a signaling uh, process in the body, but excessive oxidative stress will cause inflammation and damage to the mitochondrial membrane and the, the structures around the, the mitochondria. So uh, let's see if there. I think there's a few. Questions in here, we'll answer those and uh, any other questions pop up and then I'll kind of go through a quick review of methylene blue because this is just supposed to be meant as an intro. We'll, we'll dive deeper in it to it another time. All right. So I think I saw somebody had a question that um, yeah, somebody said that their uh, transcriptions had melted twice. That is a common complaint I've heard about it. You know, they use a polyethylene glycol peg as a binder to it. You know, their product is a trochee, which is put into the mouth to dissolve slowly uh, over 15 to 20 minutes. So it bypasses the liver and gets a little bit quicker to the brain. Um, you know, I can tell you that, you know, they have a product that, you know, doesn't taste that great. But they put some like peppermint in it, so it doesn't taste horrible. You know, you can get, you know, methylene blue powder, crystal powder and rehydrate it. And then there's some companies that sell it already hydrated and you just get a dropper and dial out the number of milligrams. You know, you have to do your own research on this one. I can't share this stuff over Instagram. You know, there's some that has to be face to face with a doctor to talk about. But you want to look for a certificate of analysis for that one. But I can tell you from personal experience that the one that I posted today earlier in my story where it looked like a Easter egg fluid that you would dip an egg in, um, that was 10 milligrams, so 20 drops. Um, and it tasted horrible. <laughs> so I chased it down with some uh, lemon lime uh, polar drink or something like that. So, um, so methylene blue is you know an interesting biohack. Um, you know, if I had a crazy infection, autoimmune condition, cancer, I would use it more frequently. Um, I could potentially be using it more as an IV uh, because of the, the higher doses that you could get uh, through that process, um, and would bypass the liver as well doing it that way. Um, oral can work. Um, but it's sometimes uh, fairly nasty to, to, to choke down. So you got to know exactly what you're doing with this stuff to, to make it worthwhile. All right. So somebody's uh, reporting that it reduces your nitric oxide. Is that true? So I'll hit it a little bit upon, you know, Somebody had mentioned you know, the link. You know, I don't know exactly how the best way to link this. I, mean, I printed this article out, so I don't know. But essentially, the article that you know, I was reading was called you know, Protection Against Neurodegeneration with Low-Dose Methylene Blue and near infrared Light. So just search the Google machine, and you'll find it. It's by Dr. Francisco Lima. Sorry, that probably does flip around backwards on, on the Instagram. But um, there's an article back in... Um, May of 2015, so it's in an article, Frontiers in Cellular Neuroscience. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, I acquired this book. Um, I'll kind of hold off it. I'm not gonna, not gonna advertise for it too much, but you know, it's you know, the ultimate guide to methylene blue. Uh, I was really excited to dig into this book. 
but um, it was really challenging to get through the bias of the author. Um, you know, the sections on methylene blue you know, goes through the history of it, talks about some possible indications for it, possible you know, um, you know, benefits and you know, dosing regimens that have been studied in different trials. So I think that part is useful. But the chapter, you know, it's a very long chapter on nitric oxide. Um, I think he's not right about it. Um, here, nitric oxide, he just keeps talking about it being air pollution and smog, and it's always bad for you and your system. You know, you know, nitric oxide is a signaling molecule, and he won the Nobel Prize uh, for medicine back in 1998. You know, it's very beneficial in the right concentration inside the arteries. So nitric oxide can be bad if it's in high concentrations and interacts with oxygen and creates peroxygen, it creates um, peroxide nitrite, O N O O O N O, uh, peroxide nitrite. That can be a problem, but nitric oxide by itself isn't the problem. So back to the, uh, the cytochrome story. So nitric oxide can bind to the four cytochrome and will block electron flow. Think of it like a handbrake. When you're eating food, you have to process it. You have to use oxygen and burn it through that engine. There's going to be smoke with that. That smoke, that oxidative stress, can damage the mitochondria, can damage the organelles outside the mitochondria. So there's times and places where you don't want to continually make oxygen you know, get reduced into water. You want to slow the energy flow, literally. So nitric oxide acts as that handbrake. So methylene blue can ultimately displace nitric oxide as can you know, using photomodulation, you know, especially the red and infrared wavelengths of light activate cytochrome C oxidase and knock nitric oxide out of there, and then the nitric oxide can diffuse into the blood vessels, causing the smooth muscle in the artery wall to relax and improve blood flow. So nitric oxide in the right location is beneficial. In the wrong location, it can be a problem, but uh, it really depends on uh, what's going on with the, uh, um, the system at that time. And then somebody is saying, you know, dosage per body weight. This is where it gets a little bit tricky, you know. Um, you know, and the only indication for met hemoglobinemia, it's a milligram per kilogram IV. Um, most trials will, you know, indicate it's between 0 0.5 milligrams and up to 4 milligrams per kilogram. That would be a very high dose, 4 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, and the half-life is somewhere between 5 hours and maybe 12 hours. So you can't take it once or twice a day. Some people report taking it in the evening time. It helps with their sleep. I've not yet tried that. Um, but, you know, I would start extremely low, you know, a couple milligrams. Earlier I talked about the, you know, the transcriptions. You know, they're just blue. Trochee has, has 16 milligrams in it, and it's scored. So you can break it into four little pieces, and, you know, you can just try four milligrams at a time and see what your exposure to four milligrams does for cognition and, you know, maybe exercise performance or whatever you're trying to, to use for it. But you'd have to use higher doses if you're trying to you know, knock out an infection. And you'd have to work with somebody who knows what they're doing with that stuff. And then question, duration of infrared exposure depends on what you're asking. But in this particular trial, you know, they used a um, laser. So they had used a infrared laser. And I'll get the uh, parameters in a minute. It was a 1064 nanometer laser. And it was a fairly high irradiance device at 250 milliwatts per centimeter square. You know, if you look at you know, the, most of the, the red light panels online, they're going to say they're 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared, but they're using most likely the wrong meters. And this is through you know, a lot of the um, postings that you see from Andrew from Gimbal Red talking about that. You, know, you got to use the right laser power meters or you know, like a third party analysis center to actually get the right irradiance. Think of it as like you know, the difference between a flashlight and a, you know, I shouldn't use a flashlight. Let's say water. So it's between like a sprinkler hose or a fire hose. Like how many photons of light is coming out of that device? That's basically what the irradiance is. So this one was 1064 nanometers, 250 milliwatts per centimeter squared, and they gave a treatment time of four minutes. And so the energy density um, was 1.2 joules per centimeter squared, and this was treating the frontal lobes. But literally only like 2% of the energy was getting through the skin, the skull, and into the brain. So four minute treatment session uh, with that particular device. That's why it's always hard to say when people say how long, it depends on the device and the irradiance. So it's always best to look at these articles and then if you have a device, do your own calculus and figure out the time duration that you'd have to use with your device.
somebody's asking if it interacts with a beta blocker. Um, this is not medical advice. So you know, if you're on certain prescription medications, you'd have to really talk to your treating doctor if there's any uh, reasons not to take it. But you know, beta blockers, you know, um, off the top of my head, I do not know if methylene blue would interact with. But you know, methylene blue is mostly you know, an electron donor to the mitochondria. You know, it can interact with some um, mono MAO inhibitors. Uh, that's the main uh, contraindicating. Also, if you have G6PD deficiency, which you would know if you had that as a child. Um, so those are the main contraindications for it. And also definitely if, you know, if you're pregnant, nursing, those type of things, the, all the, the general uh, recommendations to avoid uh, taking these type of things. Um, how long does it last in the body, methylene blue? You know, half-life is approximately five hours. So you know, the dose will be out you know, in less than a day. Um, but your body can upregulate cytochrome C oxidase. So then your body becomes more efficient in making energy. So you don't necessarily need to take it every single day unless you have a you know, acute infection that you're trying to treat, or you can do it like the biohackers do it and use a very low dose or as a nootropic. So you know, if you have a big test or a presentation, then you take it and you know, do what you need to do and then let it wear off. All right. Well, that's what I wanted to share with you guys tonight was the intro to Methylene Blue. So this is probably uh, the first time that many people have heard about it or you know, the first time that uh, people thought about maybe considering you know, a child it. You know, I did put up the poll earlier and it was overwhelming that you know, I think it was like 11 people you know, said yes, they had tried it before. Um, not saying that you must try it, but you know, I've been doing this biohacking stuff since 2017, so I'm usually gonna try stuff first that makes you know, medical sense and also doesn't seem like there's gonna be major risks from doing it. Um, so I played around with it a little bit. It helps with jet lag, helps with exercise performance. You know, definitely I've tried it a couple times before I've given a big presentation. And your mind just kind of locks on. You don't have the, the multitasking kind of brain telling you like, what about this? You know, did I leave the stove on? Like you're just focused on the thing that's right in front of you. So, you know, that's what I wanted to share tonight. I'll probably do more presentations if you know people are really interested in it. But you know, I'm all about optimizing mitochondrial function. You know, if you have Mitochondria they make energy for you, things go well. Mitochondria don't work well, diseases tend to show up. So, uh, you know, that's kind of my mito mic philosophy. So, next Monday, 6 p.m. Central Time, I'll be back Instagram Live. Uh, we'll probably pick up with a cardiovascular topic since I've kind of gone off track with doing some Ask Me Anything, so red light therapy and methylene blue. We'll go back to uh, you know, bread and butter. Maybe this is it. We'll do HDL because I keep getting all these questions about HDL. We'll do an HDL one next Monday night. So, let's see. I think a couple other questions, I'll answer them while, uh, before I. Uh, check out here, so, all right. So somebody's asking, take with empty stomach or fasting? It's water soluble, so either one works. Um, you gotta kinda play around with it. You know, uh, you know if you take it with food, it may you know, have some delayed emptying from the gastric uh, region, so it may not get absorbed as fast. Um, so it depends on the formulation. So if you're doing a trochee, well, that's not as big a deal, but if you're just liquid swallowing it, uh, you may want to do an empty stomach. Um, so thank you for being smart, yeah, sure. Uh, and yes, I didn't drink the fish cleaner version, and uh, uh, the blue tongue will go away in a couple hours. Um, and then somebody's asking, should you avoid exercise while taking it to wear off? No, not necessarily. It actually may augment exercise uh, because if you can make more ATP in your mitochondria, you're making that in the mitochondria of the muscles, uh, it may help exercise performance. Okay, well have a good week. We'll see you next Monday.